1230. How we doing, Winter Park and Sanford? Doing well? Just want to thank you so much for attending the 1230. It is my favorite service, and I love that you're not at the 1045. And so, man, I just love, love what we get to do. Hey, before we get into a brand new sermon series we're calling Living on Leftovers, be the next four weeks. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in just a moment, and in fact, all throughout the four weeks, we'll be in that one passage of Scripture. I told you a few weeks ago, uh, the weekend John Bevere was here, that uh, on this weekend, we would celebrate uh, our expansion total. If you're new to Action Church, once a year, uh, we give over and above the tithe. At Action Church, we believe in the tithe. We believe in the faithful, obedient returning of our finances. The first 10% belongs to God, but once a year... We pray, we seek God for vision, and we give over and above our tithe, and we expand uh, our ability to accomplish our mission, to reach people where they are and connect them to everything God has for their life. And, and we had a vision uh, for $4 million over the next two expansion offerings with three primary projects. And uh, if I'm being honest, I, I really thought uh, $1.5 million would be a great goal. Let's get 30, 35, 40% of the way there. Our church has been growing every single year. Uh, rapidly. The church will be much larger next year than it is this year, and we're going to get to uh, more giving next year than this year. So anyways, 1.5. And I just want to thank you for your generosity, because in our expansion offering received today, we've received $1,895,341.75. Whoever gave the 75 cents, we're so grateful. Um, and uh, what God is doing uh, in and through our church, what we're going to be able to do through South Orlando, uh, through Sanford renovations, uh, through future uh, property purchase and building purchases. We're just, we're going to keep growing uh, because heaven and hell are reality. And I just, I'm so proud uh, to be your pastor and really honored uh, to be a part of such a generous church. Like you really, you really do get it. Over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about this idea uh, of, of stopping uh, living on the leftovers. How many of you, raise your hand uh, here at Winter Park at Sanford as well. How many of you love you some leftovers? Any leftover people in here? It was kind of varied throughout our first couple services. There's some things that are good uh, with leftovers. Like a good a good, uh, good bowl of gumbo is good. Like you, you have it the first day and there's just something that happens as those ingredients sit, sit overnight. It just, it gets better. A little jambalaya this just gets a little bit better. I'm from the South. We love a good casserole around Thanksgiving or, or Christmas. There's just something it happens in that casserole. You come to a daily Thanksgiving, there's like meat and just casseroles. Like there's nothing else. Like it's just like green bean casserole and squash casserole and, and then dressing and then something that makes some fruit casserole weird deal. I, don't, I stay away from that stuff. Like if there's, I just don't know how long that fruit's been in there. I just don't really know who made that. So, but there's things that are better, but there's a lot of things that uh, as they stay in the fridge, if you will, of our life, they just, they don't, they don't last. How many of you, when you go out to eat, you always get a to-go box? Like if there's leftovers, you take it, you're scraping the plate. Come on, we've all been young and poor at one point or old and poor. You're like, yeah, I'll take this. Like what's left? Like just there's nothing left. Like, I'll take it. Give me a box. Well, Stephanie, Stephanie, my wife, she gets a box every single time. The problem is, is when we get home to our refrigerator, which is bigger than this, but this will be it for today. The refrigerator is what goes in the fridge, never comes out of the fridge and goes into the microwave. Server comes by and says, would you like a to-go box? No, we're good. Yes, we'll take it. Why? Why are we taking it? So we can grow a new organism in the fridge later? Come on, the leftovers, they, they don't last. How many of you, I was talking to Pastor John Evans this week, and he, he said his wife, Catherine, they go into their fridge, and, and they do leftovers, and they have a lot of kids, and she, she does the smell test with the Tupperware. Anybody do the smell test? You're like, is it still good? No, better not. Be honest, how many of you, once you smell it, trash don't run till Friday, you throw that thing back in the fridge? Gets hidden in the back. All of a sudden, you've got something that should not be in your fridge. It's gross. Things that stay in our life too long, things that we try to keep digesting, that we try to keep ingesting in our life, that were meant to be thrown away, that were meant for a different season. Leftovers are okay, but they're never meant to be a long-term solution. You cannot live on leftovers. They go bad. 
So we need a plan to get out of the, the fridge, out of yesterday. Some, get this, some of our fridges are full spiritually, but we don't have anything to eat because there's no fresh ingredients. Then we come over here and we've got Whole Foods threw up on this cart. And so what I see here is that I think I see that I need some salt. At some point, we're gonna have to have some salt on some of these things, but they're fresh ingredients. And my goal for our four weeks together is that we stop living on leftovers and we add some fresh ingredients to some different parts of our life. Today I want to talk about our, our, our personal disciplines, our, our personal spiritual walk with God. Next week I want us to add some fresh ingredients in, in the mission of Action Church. As we celebrate our six-year anniversary, I don't want to, as a church, be living off of last season, living on the leftovers. Week three, we're going to talk about adding some fresh ingredients to our relationships, our, our marriages with our kids, our coworkers, our classmates. And last week, really excited, we're talking about adding some fresh ingredients to our spiritual pursuit of God's presence. We need some fresh ingredients. Today, today is all about meal planning. We need a spiritual meal plan. There are some consistent things that every Christian, every believer needs in your diet and it needs to be fresh in every season. It's the same things, but it needs to be fresh. Like when you meal plan, you can't cook one thing for the whole year. You cook it for a certain amount of days and then you have to rebuy and then re-prepare and then re-cook. It may be the same thing, but it's gotta be a fresh Ingrid. Let me show you a quick funny picture. This is not what we're talking about when we talk about meal planning. Let's look at the screen. This is not meal planning. I mean, it looks good. By 1 o'clock this afternoon right now, I could take a piece of pizza, but I'm not talking about gathering something on Sunday and then making it last throughout the week. I'm talking about preparing each day with fresh ingredients. That's what you felt there was conviction. That's, that's what that feels like. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning how and when all of this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will follow them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. And don't be surprised when the day of the Lord, you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness in the night, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you were already doing. Verse 12, dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you give you spiritual guidance, show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work, and live peacefully with each other. Y'all missed that one. That was a good, good spot to say amen. I, I, I shouted in my study time this week. I was like, yes, the church will receive this word in Jesus' name. Let's read it again. Dear brothers and sisters, honor Pastor Justin, and, who's your leader in the Lord's work. He works very hard to give you great spiritual guidance. You are the best. Thank you so much. Not only are you attending God's service, but you are on God's mission of honor. Thank you. <laughs> so stupid. I'm so sorry. Let's keep reading. Holy Spirit, come back. Verse 14. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take, take tender care. I've, I've messed up that word every single service. Apparently, tender care is not my vocabulary. I'm not very tender. <laughs> tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. We've got some fresh ingredients 
specifically in verse 16 through 18 that I want to talk about today. And the first one that I want you to write down is that we need to be reading and memorizing and meditating on God's word. Go to verse uh, 16 real quick. Verse 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, always be joyful. Now, what does that have to do with God's word? Well, if we're gonna be joyful, then we have to have a proper perspective. Because without a proper perspective, you're not gonna be able to choose joy. Because I don't know about you, but, but I have tough things that happen to me. I, I go through difficulties. We get stuck in traffic. Our kids are disrespectful. We have uh, arguments with our spouses. We have stressful situations. It's not gonna be possible for me to choose joy unless I have a proper perspective. And I can only have a proper perspective if I have truth. If I have something solid to stand on. We know that, uh, the, that truth at its foundation has to come from the Bible. Biblical truth is the only thing worth building your life on. So what we need to have joy, to always be joyful, is to have a correct understanding and a correct foundation built on God's Word. It comes by reading the Word. It comes by memorizing the Word. But what I want to talk about today Let's go a little bit deeper. I want to talk about what does it look like to, to meditate on God's word. Here's what it says in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, God's word, meditating on it day and night. I looked up that word meditating in its original language in, in, in a way to describe meditating used here in this passage is chewing, excessive chewing. Sounds a little gross when you think about the visual, but you're just something that you just can't quite get out of your mouth. It's just chewing and chewing and chewing. It's like a well-done steak. And I just want to help you out. If you order your steak well done, you're doing it wrong. And in fact, I won't pay for it. We go out to dinner, I'll have the filet. Great choice, it's amazing. Uh, no pink, I like that well done. You might as well get some mustard and ketchup and a bun. You just made a burger. Like I just, you're gonna, and you're trying to argue right now, but you're still chewing that well done steak from last night. You know what I mean? Like you can't even contribute. You know what I'm talking about. You have that steak that's well done, it's tough. You just keep chewing and keep chewing and keep chewing. That's what it's supposed to look like when we get God's word on the inside of us. It's not just reading and checking it off a list. It's not just memorizing it out of duty. It's supposed to be chewing on it throughout all of our relationships and all of our situations and all of our circumstances that we just have a, a, a better and different way to live, church. Remember, uh, in seventh grade, I took uh, pre-algebra. Anybody uh, use algebra in your day-to-day -day life? Nope, not, not, well, a couple of you are math teachers. Okay, great. <laughs> Trigonometry, geometry, like I have not needed to know the cosine of anything uh, since 2002. You know what I mean? Like it's the, just never got up one day. It's like, I wonder what the cosine is. Like who cares? Tangent, isosceles, triangles, who cares? You're going to need this one day, son. Okay. I use algebra as about as much as I use cursive. Anybody else? Like, you know, I just write in my journal in cursive. Like kids, school's important. You need to know all of those things. No, you don't. Just <laughs> Moms are looking at me like, what are you talking about? I'm just trying to be real. Just trying to be, just being real. But I remember in seventh grade, you remember pre-algebra or algebra? What I loved about math, unlike any other subject, is that the odd answers were in the back of the book. How many of you are thankful for the odd answers being in the back of the book? And how many of you are still praying for the freedom from bitterness and anger from your seventh grade teacher who would assign you evens only? She needs deliverance. She is Satan's vessel. I remember coming into class and it was odds only homework and I was sitting across and I can't remember the girl's name. We'll call her Sally. I was sitting across from Sally and, and we would exchange papers to grade. Well, you know when it was odds only, your boy got 100% every single time. Like, done. I would grade Sally's homework. 
And she was so sweet and so innocent and so full of integrity, but she got C's on her odds-only homework. She goes, I just didn't feel right looking in the back of the book. Well, that's sweet, but you got a C. <laughs> Sweetie? Now, let's commend her integrity and her character, but her example is how most of us live our life. We're coming to the wrong conclusions we're solving the problems wrong, and then we're, we're complaining about it, and God is looking at us and saying, hey, the answers are in the book. Like, I gave you my word, like hundreds and hundreds of pages, and you're wondering what's wrong or what is the solution to this problem. The answer is in the book. It's a fresh ingredient that we need to read and memorize, but to to meditate, it needs to always be in our thoughts and always on our lips. And I want to get practical with you for just a moment. You can do this. Many of you read the One Year Bible on Version. If you've never heard of Version, it's an amazing app you can download on your smartphone or on your computer. But they do something really, really cool. They do a verse of the day every single day. And for, for a long time, I thought, man, if you're just reading the verse today, you're kind of you're kind of copying out. Like, man, read a whole chapter or go through a Bible plan. I want to take a step back. Just keep reading your Bible claim, Bible plan. Keep doing what you're doing. But I want us as a church to take this meditating thing really, really seriously. Let's take one verse. It's already given to us, and let's chew on it throughout the day. Like in your marriage, in your, in your workplace, in traffic. Like what if you just took that word of the day and brought it as a filter through everything else? I promise you it will be a fresh ingredient that will begin to change your life. Here's the second one. It's prayer. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. And keep on praying. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He's done. Like we have this, this, this book, the, this Word of God, that the answers are in the book, but we also can have a relationship with the author of the book. Like we can ask him the questions and research them and find them, but then we get to have a dialogue. We get to have a conversation. We get to be in a close relationship with the Holy Spirit that can give us the answer. A question for you today is, are you asking God first or are you asking God after, you, after you've already asked everybody else? Small group leader, mentor, mom, dad, book, blog, Counselor, all great resources. But why are we not asking the one that knows the best first? So many times we wait to the end of a situation to include God in it, then we pray, as opposed to starting it with God. What if the first thing we did was ask God what we should do? God, how should I handle the situation? God, do you know the best solution? It's an obvious yes. We're including him in the situation. We're talking about this this week as a staff. And one of our uh, directors at our Sanford location, Ms. Claudia, was talking about how she's, she raised up her daughter to value prayer. And she put this, this context on it, this filter on it. And it, it was really simple, but really, really great for me this week. She asked her daughter, would you ever leave the house without any clothes on? I'll ask you that question today, Winter Park Sanford. Would you leave the house naked? The answer is yes, you have problems. <laughs> no, you would never leave the safety of your home and walk into your everyday life with no physical clothes on. So why, as spiritual beings, having a temporary physical experience, because eternity is way longer, why would we ever walk out of the safety of our home into our life without putting on our, our spiritual clothes, without including God in the process? Like, why are we walking around so many times spiritually vulnerable and naked when he's saying, I just include me in everything? We need the word of God. We need prayer. The third thing we find in verse 18, it's on the screen at both locations, it says that we need to be thankful 
always. Like that we need we need to always be thankful in all circumstances. And this convicted me this week because I don't know about you, but there are some circumstances in which it's easy to be thankful, and there are some circumstances in which I, I don't choose gratitude or thankfulness very often. But this next statement is even more powerful. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will. For those of you who belong to Christ Jesus. Read that backwards. For, for, for those of you, us, who belong to Christ Jesus, it is God's will. What is God's will? For you to be thankful in all circumstances. That's a tough one. It requires the first two. You cannot give thanks in every situation if you are not building your life on God's word and in his presence. We need to give thanks for all things. Like if we realize all that God has done for us, we would be more thankful. Like remember your sin, remember your shame, remember your mistakes, remember who you were before Jesus and the fact that he saved you from that place, we should have a filter of gratitude and thankfulness. Like I, I got everything that I could never deserve, everything else is a bonus. But I wanna help us see situations differently today. Like I, I'm thankful, get this, I'm thankful for conflict with my wife. <laughs> Fill in the blank. You're like, huh? I'm thankful for conflict with my spouse because that shows me that I still have somebody worth fighting for. I'm thankful, get this, I'm thankful for the nonstop annoying questions from my nine-year-old and my five-year-old. Come on, parents. Don't look at me with judgment. You know, you're like, dear God. That's, that is the 15th why with this one. I, I'm out of whys. I don't know. Anybody else got a, uh, kids that think that they're funny and they say a joke and you don't laugh because it's not funny and they just keep repeating it? Like, I don't know if you heard me. Here's the punchline again. It's not funny, son. You're not a comedian. You're really great at math, especially the odds. Come on. You're welcome. I'm thankful for the nonstop questions because it means they still value their dad's opinion and influence and relationship. Like, I'm thankful we're having this really annoying conversation. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for my alarm because it means that I'm awake and I'm alive and God has a purpose for me today. I'm thankful for this stressful work situation because I've prayed for this job for years, just changing our perspective. Psalm 100 says, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. What if we just saw situations different in the world? God, thank you for trusting me with this pain. God, thank you for allowing me to be in this difficult situation. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, thank you. What I promise you is the first two will be foundational to your spiritual life. This third one will be foundational to your feelings. Because when you begin to thank God in every situation, your feelings will begin to line up with your prayer time and what you have in the word of God because you'll change the way you see things. And when you change the way you see things, it will change the way you feel about it. You gotta give thanks in every situation. How? Here's a couple practical ways. A couple practical ways and we'll get out of here. It says, be thankful always. How? You know these, but I'm gonna give them to you with some verses so you can really reflect on them this week. The first way we get out of ourselves and, and are more thankful is we become more generous. I wrote down the word giving this week, 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's such a powerful verse, that, that if we are generous, God is gonna give us all we need and more than enough so that we can then increase our generosity. But I love how the, the New King James and the ESV says it, verse eight, I wanna read out of there. It says, if we give cheerfully, not under pressure, if we decide, if we are generous, here's God's promise. You gotta get this. 
And God is able to make all grace abound to you. I gotta teach you something real quick. Grace is not just what saves you. God's grace saves you. It gives us what we did not deserve. But, but another definition for grace in the New Testament is grace gift. It is God's grace. It is God's empowerment to his people to accomplish everything that he's calling us to accomplish. So what he's saying, if we're, if we're more thankful and we uh, show that through our generosity and through our giving, that he is going to give us all of the grace. So if we are givers, then God is gonna give us all of the grace that we need to be the Christ follower, to be the husband, to be the wife, to be the coworker, to be the person on mission for the gospel, if we will begin to thank him for what he's done and show that thankfulness through giving to other people. It's amazing your perspective that changes when you give to somebody else. You know why? When you give to somebody that has less than you, you're reminded of how much you have. I have so much left over that I can give. And it changes our perspective from not from what we're lacking, or what's been taken, or what we don't have, but to all that we've been given. And from that place, it reminds us to be thankful. The second one is this, very similar. It's serving. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says that God gives us all these gifts out of his wide variety of spiritual gifts, that each one of us would use them well to serve one another. We have an opportunity as a church coming up in two weeks, February 1st, to reach our city in a way that we've never done it before. We have enough projects, and we're believing for a 1,000 people who call Action Church home to go out over that full day all throughout Winter Park, Winter Springs, Oviedo, Castleberry, Sanford, Lake Mary, South Orlando, Conway, downtown, and go and reach people where they are and connect them to everything God has for their life by meeting practical needs and arranging the meeting with Jesus Christ. And I'm just here to tell you, if you will spend a few hours on that Saturday, you will walk out of that place more thankful. You were created to make a difference, and some of us don't have the proper perspective because we are not doing what God commands, being thankful and showing that through our generosity and through our time and service. You know, I really wrestled this, this four weeks. We're going somewhere, and this was very much an introduction. We, we needed to start with these fresh ingredients of meal planning because without a proper personal spiritual diet, we cannot get to mission, we cannot be effective in relationships, and we cannot even draw closer to God if we don't get these first steps, these first ingredients in our system. But I know, I knew the pushback. You're like, oh, this is, this is one of those spiritual discipline messages. I, I've heard this before. Like, I really appreciate, Pastor, that you spiced it up with a little microwave and a little refrigerator and you went grocery shopping or somebody went grocery shopping. I don't know where that came from. But, but thank you for making it a little more uh, illustrative. But I got it. Like, you want me to pray and read my Bible and, and, and be more grateful. Yeah, I got it. All the spiritual disciplines. It's so simple. But what if I told you our spiritual journey is way more simple than we make it? That we're the ones that overcomplicate it. We make it harder than it really is. We need to work on making it more simple. I remember when I was a college golfer, I was going through a swing change. And if you play golf, you know that if you ever get in your head about anything, the, the more you think about it, the more you overcomplicate it, the worse you play. And it's the same in life. So when I was going through that swing change, I, I wrote this down, and maybe you've heard of this before, but I wrote it right here on my glove. I had a white glove uh, and, and big, bold, black Sharpie. I wrote four letters, K period, I period, S period, S period. What that stood for was keep it simple, stupid. It's easier than you think, Justin. Quit making it complicated. Keep it simple, stupid. Spirit of God needs to speak to somebody today and say, keep it simple, stupid. Did he just call me stupid? Okay, let me, let me PG that a little bit. Keep it simple, silly. No, it's too soft. Quit being stupid. Let me prove it. 
God, I, I feel confused. God, I, I need some clarity. God, I don't, I don't think, I don't think or feel. You're, you're just not speaking to me anymore. K-I-S-S. Where did you leave off? Like, where did he stop speaking? What page did, did it cease to become the word of God? Like, what, when, when did it stop being living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword? When did it stop being a light into your dark situation? I'm just going to keep turning pages until everybody claps. Like, just so you know, like, that's just, I got lots left. He stopped speaking because you stopped opening. I feel stressed and overwhelmed. Pray. The word of God reminded us today, don't be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. The next promise we didn't read is that if you will do that, then God will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I feel, I feel stressed. I feel selfish. I feel, I begin to give thanks. I feel envious of my neighbor, of my brother, of my friend, give thanks for all that you have. Keep it simple. Silly. Always be joyful. What a simple thought. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. And give thanks in all situations. And I believe with that meal plan, and with those ingredients, we will begin to be healthier spiritually, be used at greater efficiency, and be more fulfilled in Jesus' name. Would you bow your heads here at Winter Park at Sanford as well? God, we love you. We thank you for your word. First Thessalonians chapter 5 is living and active. It's changing us today. God, I thank you right now for simple reminders. Sometimes we want to understand more and make things so complicated and what you did for us is not complicated you did what we could never do you gave your son Jesus and you give us some practical ways to stay in close relationship with you hey church nobody look around every head bowed every eye closed some of you some of you need to start a relationship with Jesus today those first few verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 they were read for you today Jesus is returning for his church my question for you, get this, is he returning to rescue you or to judge you? Are you ready or will you be surprised? The good news is that Jesus lived. He lived for you a perfect life as an example so that he could die as you in your place as a sacrifice not staying there, but being raised to a new life, giving you victory over your current struggle and ultimately over the sin that has kept you in captivity. What's your job? It's to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord. It's important that that word Lord is included because you and I have to give over control of our life to receive Jesus. Simply put, we have to surrender our will to his will. What if you did that today? Others of you, you've been living on the leftovers. And you walked an aisle, you prayed a prayer, you checked a box, you joined a church, you ascribed to religion, but you've never had the life-changing, eternity-changing decision and surrender to Jesus. What if you did that today? I need some fresh ingredients. I'm starting a new relationship with Jesus today. For the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time, you would say, Pastor Justin, I want a relationship with Jesus today. If that's you, would you raise your hand right where you are? Say, I'm starting a relationship, or I am recommitting my life today. I got one, two. I'm proud of you. Three right there in the middle, yep. Four in the back. Yep. So good. Come on, Sanford. Holy Spirit is moving in your auditorium right now as well. Raise your hand high. Declaring you're putting your faith in Jesus today. Proud of you. 
put your hands down. Pray this in your heart as I pray it out loud. Say something like this. Say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I'm saved only by your grace. And I am confessing with my mouth and I'm believing in my heart that you are the Lord. I'm giving you that place today. Complete and total control. God, have your way in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now, God, I pray for all of us. God, I pray this week that we would choose joy because we're gonna be meditating on your word. God, we're gonna pray and include you first in every situation. And then we're gonna be thankful. Showing that by our generosity and our time spent serving others. We're gonna keep it simple in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done today. It's in your son's name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Church, can we celebrate all the decisions? Come on, celebrate them.